Welcome to everybody that I haven't seen for ages, my family, my friends, and people that I've never met before. Um, <clears throat> I've just come from Province Assembly in Leeds, and uh, it has awakened me to my mission in a most extraordinary way, and the mission of my institute, of, of my province, of the mission of God alive in the world today. And being in Blackfriars, which is a Dominican uh, house of, of academia, of spirituality, of knowing, and, and I'm very privileged to enter into this place and offer a few words uh, relating to the mission of God in our world today and in the field of human trafficking. I put this picture as a starter because um, today we are in a world which is more mobile than even during the first two world wars. I say the first two world wars, hoping there will never be another. But it is incredible that not only have we got a world of intense mobility, but also, and this, this is very significant, is that there are more deaths today through suicide than in war, which is incredible. And when you consider the criminal activity around the world, which is more clandestine than ever in the history of our world, then it is not surprising that we are trying to cope as human beings with a fast changing and truly stressful scenes around us in our ordinary everyday waking lives. So how do we work in mission and how do we embrace love and freedom and a spirit of hope when all around us this is our reality it's real and it's very painful so here we have classic picture of a woman migrant one of the millions on the move. And we know today that where there is vulnerability, where there is movement, where there is poverty, there the traffickers will be. And as Christians, we're asking ourselves, where is Jesus, where is love? Where is hope? When so many millions, 35 million traffic today, where is love in the midst of this? We know, in fact, that our neighbor is where Jesus is loving. And caring and in the midst of the movement there are equally millions of people in the rescue in the rehabilitation in the caring and the compassion and the empathy and so we ask ourselves am I my brother my sister's neighbor am I on board Am I working against human trafficking? Am I working to care for the vulnerable? Am I walking the walk? Because the call is, of course, for all of us. So now we're looking at the migrant routes. I was in uh, Lesbos and I've been in Lampedusa over the last year. As you know, Renata, which is religious in Europe, networking against trafficking and exploitation, 
is in 30 European countries and we work very closely together with the rescue, the reintegration and the rehabilitation of trafficked victims that come through the uh, circuit, if you like, and rescue work of the migrant. And in Lesbos, which is the, the route through into Greece from North Africa, I met 12 pregnant girls who had just been rescued off the boat. Many had died in the Mediterranean on the way. These 12 girls were totally traumatised. They had been made pregnant on the way and had been used by traffickers in the boats for making money. It was wonderful that there I was with a Greek woman called Dina, who's part of our Renata network, and she was able to gently, step by step, find shelter for these 12 girls. Often, as we found in Palermo, it's just much more difficult. It may not just work out. And there in Palermo, there were about 100 minors in a rescue shelter for 60 people. They hadn't enough money from the Italian government to care for these youngsters. They had no shoes, their clothes were very poor, and I know from what the leaders were telling us that they had very poor food. And these were helpless. They had come off the boat. They had no family. They had either been sent by family for a better life or they had run from their place of distress for a better life. But these young people, their stories they told us of how they had been exploited on the way for labour and for sex was incredible and they were all under 16. So this is part of the reality of the work against human trafficking in the, in the whole mobility migrant world. And it's, it's very cruel and it's very difficult. This is just to show you something of the levels of the trafficked and the movement. So the brown areas of the world are where large numbers of people are being trafficked their countries of origin, whereas the blue and the light blue are the countries of destination. So we'll see that England is very much a country of destination and where I live in Albania is brown. You see little Albania there, and it's a dark brown. And there we are, a country of origin, and in England today, the highest number of traffic victims come from Albania. And I straddle the two, two countries, the two nations. So what happens? I'm just trying to kind of link all of this with stories to make it real. But what can happen when an Albanian who has very little English is trafficked into a scene of sex tourism in Britain and has no language, finds she's probably been promised a job or a lover boy has promised her marriage and a better life. She's been trafficked through, through uh, Germany usually, uh, Italy maybe dipped down into France and then through the tunnel. These are the usual routes. And she finds herself, you know, with 10 to 20 clients a day. She's rescued in trauma, has no real English to, to find her way through the trauma, often disassociation, where she has formed a new identity to survive the horror of the multiple sex act that she's had to engage in. And so in order for us cross-border to support this work, our therapists in Albania now counsel online trauma victims from Albania rescued into the shelters 
in the UK, mainly the Madai Trust shelters who have 10 shelters for girls and boys. So we second one of our therapists for a day a week purely to help and work with trauma victims from Albania in the UK who have been rescued from the brothels or the massage places or wherever. And this is what's happening all over the world, this cross-border rescue, rehabilitation <coughs> and care. The problem always comes when there is a natural disaster. And uh, an example is when there was the terrible earthquake in Haiti and the traffickers come in very fast when there's vulnerability. And in that situation, a trafficker rescued, as it were, 32 orphaned children and declared to the state there that they were going to take them to a safe home. In fact, they were whisked through the airport and out very fast after the disaster took place. And through DNA, they were rescued after being victims and thrown into homes for domestic work in Colombia. Would you believe it? All these children were rescued in Colombia, but had there not been a very amazing organization in Haiti that had DNA'd all vulnerable children, because the state is a failing state anyway, these children would never have been rescued. So uh, all these stories are showing how we can use modern technology for rescue and reintegration, but not to disguise the horror of the crime. Sorry. This just quickly to see the roots, you can see um, very clearly how right across the world the traffickers are moving very intelligently um, with their victims in huge gangs, clandestine criminal gangs, some of which stem way back to the, crop, uh, to the communist criminal gangs that have been used for drug dealing and now are into human trafficking because it is easier to get money and to get away with human trafficking today than drug trafficking. But we also know that these routes are if you like, um, unreal in one sense because a huge amount of trafficking today is done in the deep net, the dark net. And I can remember a wonderful young Oxford University student coming out to Albania to do a research with us on trafficking in Albania and she told me that she reckoned from her peer group here that probably 80% of Oxford University students surf the dark web. Not to say that they use it for crime, but that's where they will find out about the crime. So here, if there are academics, if there are care people who work with students, it's really important that we look at this fierce form and service for criminal beha behaviour taking place and how many are using it for setting up porn, porn uh, sites, for setting up illegal agencies, for uh, actually buying and selling humans, plus another whole array of illegal activity. This is physically how we see it, with the boats, with the aeroplanes, with the trucks. I was talking to a young man in Albania about three weeks ago, and he had just been deported back to Albania from the Netherlands, from Rotterdam. He'd managed to get to the Netherlands, had cut a piece out of a truck, the tarpaulin, got himself into it, but in fact he'd been followed by the Europol detectives and was caught again and this was the third time and he said he'd do it again to get a better life 
but his passport had been taken from him for three years, I think, um, in order that he can learn from his, his criminal activity. So it's many, many ways that people are moving across the world in this illegal crime, in this illegal activity. So we can see this, the increase. The reality is over 22, 32 million traffic globally. Actually, these are the convictions at the top. But in Britain, today, they will say this year there has been a 156% increase of trafficking in Britain from known potential convictions and rescue work. Now that doesn't mean to say that Britain is the worst. It probably means that Britain is the best because it's being honest, it's got law in place and it's trying to follow through through training of police to capturing the criminals. Right across the world the law is weak, the law is muddied between laws about migration and laws about illegal migrancy and trafficking. It's even unbelievably weak across Europe to do with child trafficking. If I give you an example of Hungary actually states nothing in the law about abusing a child sexually. Nothing in the law. There are many countries where they have just not got their act together about modern crime that is now known. So if you are in positions where you can influence through advocacy, law, it will make a huge difference to this crime of trafficking because most laws in most countries have not got the goodwill of governments to ensure that justice is on the side of the victim and that the client is convicted. It's too weak. In Norway and Sweden, they have declared a law called the Nordic Model which criminalizes the client of a prostitute. In England, the law criminalizes a client who has sex with a trafficked victim, if it can be proved. There's huge debate on how to suppress demand. Because if you take it that 67% of trafficked victims are trafficked into the sex industry, then we have to ask ourselves, why is there such a huge demand for sex, which actually gives the traffickers an opportunity to ply their trade? These are many, many questions unanswered. The other uh, picture that I moved on from was just declaring the areas of trafficking so, some of it I've already spoken of, but one I haven't is organ trafficking. And organ trafficking is um, a very, very strongly increasing crime where there's great poverty. And certainly in the migration routes from places like Syria, we have some actual evidence that when somebody escapes from war and they have their family with them and they've run with very little money and they have very few means to protect their families, a family will, or a leader of the family, it might be a brother or a father, will very rapidly succumb to the wish of a trafficker to buy an organ. And we have stories of people we know, families that have come into our rescue field in Europe where the last of the male population has died 
because they have given their organs, but in a very black market, I shouldn't use that word, but in a, you know, back street uh, clinic where the, the care, the cleanliness is not there and they sell their kidney or they sell another part of their body in the hopes of the money, but they die. Many have died in this trafficking of organs. So it's something for us to be aware of, child trafficking, child begging, soldier trafficking of children. We know where there's a war and it's a civil war, internal war. Children in their thousands are being trafficked into mercenary armies and used as young as six and seven to, to work, to work in the field of war. And it's a horrendous end of life for these children. So we need to just absorb all of these stories which are very real and true and in our own backyard of the world. This just looks at the manner in which the trade is taking place and how money is being traded. And besides cash, which is the 52%, which migrants are paying their smugglers and then the smugglers sell them on to the traffickers and so on, this is the roots. There's also um, what we call non-monetary, non like um, this hawala, which is, uh, it's like deals within deals and across borders, money is promised and paid for by the smuggler to the client and the client on and so on. It's a very, I don't understand it at all myself, to be truthful. All I do know is that there is, there is a paper money which is promised and it's, it's the only way uh, some of the kidnapped, the trafficked, are able to get money to uh, back to their families if they receive anything at all, which is why they went in the first place, was to save the family back home or to escape their own impossible situation. I'm not explaining that terribly well, but maybe there's an economist in the room that can explain it better for me. This is a very good little uh, diagram which shows how there is an increase of men being trafficked and <coughs> boys, both for labour but also for sex. And in England, we would say that the increase of men trafficked is for the, often in terms of the agricultural work. I think we all know about this and also the car washes. We, we have to be very aware where we take our cars in the UK. They have convicted many traffickers already in the UK who are, who are having slave labour from victims that are sold off to them for cheap labour living in horrendous conditions across the country, but also agriculture and fishing and uh, the boat. The whole of the sea world is awash with the criminal activities of traffickers, but male victims are very much on the increase. Now we want to look at, um, this, is, this is specifically the details relating to our shelter in Albania, okay? Every year we have about 40 girls that will pass through our shelter. We have 15 beds and rooms for mothers and babies, okay? And this is uh, where they would have been trafficked from. And also in the shelter in Albasan, where we have children, victims of trafficking. So, when it's sex trafficking, this would be the norm. Today we have a huge increase in the online and I'm afraid even in Albania we have some evidence of traffickers making porn films and selling them off to the deep net. And even foreign girls coming into Albania for domestic work are being used for these sex films and it's, it's hugely difficult for police to discover where the crime is taking place. 
and we have the normal truck stops. Um, this is very big in Africa more than I think in Britain, but certainly across Europe on the highways, this is where girls are being sold into sex. And then we have the usual um, norms of labour trafficking, doesn't mention the car wash here, but we know in Britain this is strong. And also, I think you know about the nail bars is the latest in Britain, where traffic, traffickers are being used behind the nail bars for sex and porn. Okay, so who are the traffickers? This just illustrates some of the reality from Albania. Um, recently, we uh, have begun to work in the women's prison and one of our psychotherapists is working with six traffickers, all women. And all these women were caught in the same activity of trafficking, which it certainly surprised me because it was so intimate. And what they were doing was they were neighbours in the villages. Most of our girls are trafficked from the rural areas in the mountains. These women were all from these villages, different villages. And their job was to groom the young girls in the village of a better life, more opportunity. They introduced them to the traffickers as safe people who would give them a better life. They stayed with the couple as they were wooed. Often the girl was given a mobile phone, presents. It might take eight to ten months a year that this would happen within Albania. And then the promise would be to go across border with false passport. And then, of course, the whole story begins of trafficking. These six women were caught in the very process of grooming. And so the girls did not leave the country in this particular situation because they were caught having got, the police having got to understand this process. So we need to know that it's very ordinary situations where traffickers ply their trade and it's kind of ordinary people at that level that become the traffickers. But in Britain we know that in that pentameter raid three years ago, the head of the trafficking gang was a, a doctoral student at Sheffield University from China. He was a billionaire. It was extraordinary. The numbers engaged in the trafficking gang was huge, huge. But this young man, youngish man, was happily getting on with his doctoral thesis in a student room. It was amazing, you know? So this is, the stories are hugely complex and varied according to the levels of the traffickers. They say government personnel are involved in trafficking. They say politicians, they say teachers, corporates, are all involved. We have to see who knows the full truth. So this is the reality of the traffic, yeah. Pretty well, we all know that pretty well every trafficked person, generally speaking, comes from a vulnerable situation. They may not be poor, but it could be that the first person I met in Rome called Sophie, who was trafficked, was English. She was not poor, but her mother had been beaten up by her father and it was a domestic violence environment. So we could safely say, I don't know any trafficked person who hasn't come from some sort of vulnerability and wants to escape from it. So these are some of the examples. And the impact is isolation disassociation, loneliness, fear, 
many other sad, sad experiences. And this is where I wanted to show you a film, but I'm not sure. Oh yes, maybe we can. Looks as if we can here. You must have good equipment, I think. This is a film that was on your BBC. You may have seen it. <coughs> it's set in Albania, and it actually gives you a very, very good understanding of the trafficker and the trafficked. And I think this is a good point. Blessed with natural beauty, but the center of a dark trade. Albania has over two decades built up a brutal industry with human beings, the commodity. I hate them and I want them to get the punishment that they deserve. Saya, now still a teenager, was just 14 when she was sold into a trafficking ring by a man she thought was her boyfriend. She was forced to sleep with several men a day and tells of a bewildering and terrifying world of abuse in which she could trust no one. There were the other girls there too, but I did not talk to them, because you could not tell who was connected to whom. We were terrified. They would beat us up and not let us go out to be controlled by someone, to be used as I was, is totally degrading. <laughs> she lives here, in a refuge for trafficked women in the south of the country. But these are schoolgirls, and some already have children of their own. All have escaped their traffickers. Saya helped put some of hers behind bars. Several convicted traffickers are held here in Korcha High Security Prison. Last year, 18 people were sentenced. Some here are serving 20 years or more. The Albanian authorities let us talk to one of them. Fatos Kaplani was sentenced to 15 years for trafficking children to Greece and forcing them to work as prostitutes or beggars. What made him, a married man with his own children, commit such a crime? It was the time that everyone was doing that kind of thing. You used a child in order to earn some money. Isn't what you did entirely wrong? It's terrible. What if that were my child and someone did that to them? He faced justice, but Albania has been criticized for a lack of prosecutions, and there are concerns over police collusion. Some senior figures question whether trafficking is a real problem, but the official line is that there are systems to deal with it. It's not a, a, a con big concern as used to be many, many, many years ago. Uh, we have a system in place as we're working, but and it's not an increasing trend. It is a phenomenon that is kind of constant, but it has to be tackled properly and to make always all the structures working together. But it's away from the modern capital city that all too often traffickers find their victims. Albania remains a poor country and in many areas a woman's role is still seen as being in the home. Young women in small town Albania can be easy prey for groomers seduced by promises of a better life. That better life is invariably outside Albania, but Anna never dreamt of her fate. I he said he was looking for a girl just like me and he wanted to start a family. She is now in a safe house in the UK, duped into leaving home and then sold into prostitution. She weeps throughout our interview, but insists she wants to tell her story. I was somewhere underground. I had no sense of the world around me. They would not let me see. I entered the building blindfolded. And you were raped every day? Yes, every day. <laughs> Many men? Yes, many. <laughs> Anna is now supported in this safe house run by the Salvation Army. She has a baby, which gives her a reason to carry on. Her story should trigger alarm in authorities here and across Europe, a broken life caused by a brutal crime. Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News. The film, just to say a little bit about the film, it's set in, uh, the prison is set in the south of Albania. And the key thing when the interviewer from BBC is interviewing him, she says to him, how can you, who are a father of three children, traffic children? And he said, 
because everybody was doing it. There's an interesting ethical stance. Everybody was doing it. When she interviewed the girl, which she does, the trafficked, she, the, the point that really comes out from her pain is that she was made through violence and drugs to be raped up to 20 times a day. And it was the violence and the drugs that made her cry because she had been redeemed totally out of control. And the force, the exploitation, was done to her when she was in not only a position of vulnerability because of her whole background, but because she had been made vulnerable by the traffickers and redeemed totally helpless. What do you mean by redeemed? Work, well, redeemed. redeemed. We think of redeemed, don't we, as being made better. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it means transformation into something other. Yeah. Mm. So the consequences. I'm going to slip past this because we're going to look at this in more detail. Okay, so the background. This is exactly for our girls last year, okay? So we had 25, and all of those backgrounds show dysfunctionality, okay? The brown lived with a step-parent, the yellow, one parent has died, the green, abandoned at birth by a parent, and the grey, a victim of incest. So all of the girls have been suffering anyway, okay? And this is the age group. So they ranged from 14 to 36 in our shelter last year. How were they led to be vulnerable to trafficking? So, as you see, huge percent, 47, a promise of a false marriage. Hope, being loved, cared for. The grey, another big percent, 28, was false job, a job which wasn't existing. Kidnapping and then sold off. Marriage, some were married. Some of our girls are married to their lover boy and after the marriage they are sold and they are controlled by the husband as in the case I was explaining to you earlier of one of our girls who was actually pregnant and we didn't know she'd been trafficked until a year on nearly when she was in a mentally uh, mental sick uh, department of, of the hospital because of her behaviour and our therapist was able to work with her and discovered signs of trafficking but it did not come out for a long time. So false promise of accommodation, food and protection with labour, labour opportunity. So now we move into what therefore they need. They come to us in trauma, physically and psychologically damaged, often with parts of their body very, very deeply damaged. So where do you go? So certainly the first thing is they get a personal supporter, a, a mentor, somebody you can listen, take time. It might take a long time, but little by little, the whole process of rehabilitation takes place and don't forget we're kind of lucky because in Albania they're coming back to us whereas in Britain 
They're doing this work with up to, I was in three shelters this year in Britain, and I must have met, I think, at least 10 nationalities. And many of them had very, very little English. And in the one in Southampton, the trauma, the level of trauma of some of these girls was like I have never seen before. So this is real kind of living experience of what people are coping with here in Britain. In Albania, they are Albanian girls generally, maybe one or two from abroad, but it means the communication is more clear and we can work towards rehabilitation in a more kind of what you'd say step-by-step -step manner. I think uh, this is very clear. You might want to read this. These are what was, these are the illnesses presented last year by our victims of trafficking when they arrived. So there's a whole series of mental disorders from the trauma, but there's also, as you can see, a whole series more of physical disorder. Now, I went to a doctor before I went to Albania to get my jabs for Albania because there were certain levels of illness, disease there that I needed to be protected from. And the doctor said, why do you need these? Where are you going? And I explained that I was working anti-trafficking. I'd be working in all sorts of uh, rural parts and so on. And she said, do you know, she said, last week, I had a girl come to me with a woman that I could see she was not related to. And she had very bad damage to her genital parts, but I didn't know what to do about it. And I was ama amazed. No, I wasn't amazed because I was very young in this work myself. But I was saying to myself, how difficult that must be for a doctor to have a sense that there is something wrong and not know what to do. So now, 15 years on, there is a whole methodology in medical uh, centers and in police places, in hotels, in airports, in ports where ships are going in and out. There's all sorts of education going on so that the professionals are also aware how they can rescue and care for, because this is done in a network. We're just little pins, not even a pin in the whole force that's needed. And it's only together that the rescue, the rehabilitation, the care, the prevention, the advocacy, the campaigning can only be successful if the world itself comes together, every human person to work against the crime in small ways and large ways, however you see it. What happens once they get some kind of physical and mental balance? Then, of course, we move very strongly into the employment counselling. Some go back to school because they're young. Uh, some go to vocational trainings. Every single individual dreams, begins to dream of how they can have a life. And indeed, uh, they go, they always have money in their pocket. That's a necessity to feel independent. They have support for their pregnancies, having their babies, and they have uh, uh, parenting lessons and mother and child lessons and so on. And all of this goes towards a package of independence. And once they get a job, which they all do, they will move either back home if reconciliation can take place. Often it can't because they may have been sold with the help of family, family relatives. Or they indeed go into work in a flat and they go together and life does go on. We have lawyers and mechanics and hairdressers and painters and married with children and happy people in the future. They still have 
the trauma around, they know they've been through this, but there is a life. This is just some pictures of, uh, we have a computer suite. This is our education centre and uh, opportunities for all sorts of development, of human empowerment and development and joy. And this was paintings done by some of our trafficked girls for an exhibition that we had in the cathedral for Bakita Day, which is February the 8th. And it's a day that the whole world comes to pray against human trafficking. And here it says, freedom has somehow been out of my reach. Since a sinless baby, the freedom many rights were taken and stepped on. Freedom is my basic human right, and I will run away as many times as I have to in order to breathe its fresh, sweet air that calms my wounded heart. And that was written by one of our girls. So why human trafficking? I think we've spoken mostly today about why, but we know it's greed is at the heart. Anything to do with money and amassing money has at its heart greed. It's pride and power. It's failure in our world to recognise law must absolutely be on the side of human rights, always. It's a world in which a modern slave is sold cheap and which is sold on for huge gain. And then we have the whole problem of the lack of law about the internet and the lack of control of the dark web. This is a story which I already told you, actually, and it ended um, with the girl from the psychiatric wing of the hospital being rescued and going into a shelter but it took that length of time and she was referred to us by the police from the street and finally I can get to it I just wanted to give you this image of hope and this is in Canada and a year ago, I was in Canada at a gathering of all our sisters uh, who were called forth, some reps from every province, to discern mission for the future. On one of the mornings, we were all given a drum. And every drum was different, and there were a hundred of us. Imagine. And we were taught to drum the whole morning. We were taught to drum with our drums. And at the end of the morning, the little group who were teaching us said, now, I want you all to drum together. Imagine, 100 drums. We'd had one morning, and off we went. And after about, I don't know, five minutes, I was amazed, because there was a rhythm. It was fantastic. It was like being heaven and not. You know, it was just like extraordinary harmony. So I stopped my drumming because I couldn't believe it. And I began to listen. How did we create such rhythm, such harmony? And then I heard this amazing That's all. And the master of teachers was at the heart of us and he was just doing that and we must have all picked up this rhythm and with our drums we were getting in touch with the rhythm and my call to us today is to say if we go deep enough into the source of our very beings we will touch the rhythm of God because it's kind of on fire and it's passionate and it's drawing us and urging us to greater love. And that brings us together in a harmony that sees the needs, that senses the love, senses the pain 
and invites us to respond. So that's what I do with us all today. Let us respond together. Okay, thank you. Thank you.